She served as a board member for the Humane USA PAC and as legislative liaison for the Captive Wild Animal Protection Coalition. And now she's, as she's serving as the CEO of Big Cat Rescue, she, along with her family, dozens of interns and over 100 volunteers have led Big Cat Rescue to become the largest nonprofit accredited rescue facility for big cats in the world, which is a really noteworthy accomplishment and something that's really fantastic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Carol Baskin. As she mentioned, my name is Carol Baskin. I'm the founder and CEO of Big Cat Rescue. And we are the largest accredited sanctuary in the world that is dedicated entirely to abandoned and abused big cats. We are home to over 100 lions, tigers, bobcats, <laughs> cougars, and other species, most of whom have been abandoned, abused, orphaned, saved from being turned into fur coats, or retired from performing acts. Our dual mission is to provide the best home we can for the cats in our care, and also to educate the public about the plight of these magnificent animals, both in captivity and in the wild to end abuse, and to avoid extinction. We were founded in 1992 with the rescue of a bobcat named Winsong, who was being auctioned to taxidermists who said they were buying her to turn her into a den decoration. That led us to buying out all of the bobcats and lynx on fur farms in 1993, 1994, and 1995. The deal we made with the fur farmers was that we would pay top dollar for every cat they had as long as they would quit turning cats into fur coats. And then the phone started to ring and people would say, would you take my lion? Would you take my tiger? And I'm like, what are you people doing with lions and tigers? <laughs> Our nonprofit sanctuary is home to 100 big cats and it costs us $1.5 million a year just to take care of those 100 cats. The cats at the sanctuary came to us for a variety of reasons, including performing acts where they were abused by uh, their owners in order to make them perform. They have come to us from circus acts, nightclub acts, advertising providers, and traveling road shows. They come from backyard breeders, and as Tracy mentioned, one of the worst providers, breeders, of these tiger cubs is right here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The tiger on the left in the picture here came from a facility. I heard somebody here had seen the movie, The Tiger Next Door. This guy was breeding tigers in Indiana. He claimed to have bred over 200 tigers trying to breed the perfect white tiger that he could get a lot of money for selling to the magicians in Las Vegas. The golden tigers in this industry are referred to as throwaway tigers. The public wants to pay to see white tigers and the golden cubs are often incinerated at birth. They've also been abandoned by people who had them wrongly thinking that they could make pets of them. Most people don't start out thinking, hey, I want to get a tiger as a pet. What happens is the people who are using these tiger cubs for photo opportunities where people pay to play with the cubs, they can only use them, like Tracy mentioned, for a very short period of time. They have a one month shelf life and then they can live for 20 years. So those exploiters are desperate to get rid of those cubs and will tell people, hey, this cat was bottle raised, it's been around people its whole life, it's gonna be just like a dog, you raise it in the family, it's gonna love your children and your pets, and when that cat gets to be a year old, it's 200 pounds if it's a tiger. By the time it's four years old, it can be 500 pounds, and people just can't get rid of them fast enough. You'll, you'll hear Tracy and I harping on this because we're part of a coalition, it's the Big Cat Coalition, and we got together two years ago in DC. And this is why I'm so excited about what you guys are doing because individually all of our organizations can do great work, but nothing like what happens when we all come together and work together. And so what the coalition, uh, which uh, composed of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, the Humane Society of the United States, the World Wildlife Fund, Born Free, Big Cat Rescue, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the Ian Summerhounder, if you guys know the guy from the Vampire Diaries, uh, his attorney was part of our, our coalition. And what we did was we said, okay, there's this huge problem with tigers in America. How do, we, how do we fix this? And part of what we did was we looked at where are these tigers coming from? And if we could stop it at its root, then we could really fix the tiger problem in America. 
And what we discovered is that the cub petting is the number one reason that there are so many unwanted big cats in America. And there, I don't feel like there's anything that we can do to save tigers in the wild until we fix this mess we've made in our own country. We have no credibility on a national scale as long as we've got people doing cub petting and playing with cubs and taking cubs out to malls and flea markets and parking lots. We can't say anything about what China's doing farming tigers when we're doing this kind of stuff. China says, we know where our tigers are. You don't even know where yours are. As long as it's legal for the private sector to possess tigers, there will be no way to discern illegally traded tiger parts from those of captive bred cats. If somebody gets caught with a tiger carcass, all they have to do to avoid prosecution is say, that's my pet tiger. It's so legal in so many places for people to have tigers, and Tracy showed you the map of the states where six states have no laws whatsoever. I find it interesting that Florida is listed as a state that bans the private possession of tigers. But they say if you get a $40 USDA permit, now you can have tigers in your backyard. So that's really no deterrent to people having these tigers. And they can trade openly in these tigers because it's legal in so many states. So there's no way to know if a tiger carcass actually came from the wild. If you're sensitive, you might want to close your eyes before I show you this next slide. It costs us $10,000 per tiger per year just to provide the veterinary cost and the food for those cats. That doesn't include the overhead of the sanctuary. So if you have to raise a tiger for two or three years to get them to full size in order to harvest them for their fur and their bones and their organs, then it's going to cost thousands of dollars, even if you're doing it in a really bad way and not taking care of the animal. It's still going to be thousands of dollars. A bullet costs a dollar. So it's always going to be cheaper for people to poach tigers out of the wild than it will be for them to breed them and raise them for these markets. And if you allow tiger farming and the use of tigers, it increases the demand for those products. When you cr increase demand, what happens is the people who can really afford the good stuff, they want the wild tiger. They want the real tiger. They don't want the tiger that's only a shadow of himself that was raised in a cage for his whole life. So it's always going to put more pressure on tigers in the wild. One way that you guys can help is to get undercover video. Um, Ron back there asked me if those pictures of kids petting tigers were at our place because Tracy said, we got these from Big Cat Rescue. Oh, yeah. That did not happen at Big Cat Rescue. <laughs> we do a lot of undercover work. And so this next video that I'm going to show you is some of the things that we've been able to photograph and videotape behind the scenes that help us get these laws changed. You guys, you know, people know my face. I can't sneak into anywhere and get any kind of footage anymore, but you guys are pretty much unknown still. You can get into these places and get the kind of video that you're going to see in this next video here. This one? Uh, there you go. whole room full of tech support. Thank you. <laughs> the eight-week-old cub I got to pet was obviously sick and barely moved during our visit. Another cub on display was missing a patch of fur and clearly not happy to have its photo taken. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with his fur?
they make it look like they're kissing the cub, they're blowing in the cub's face, which is what the mother does right before she whacks the cub for doing something that's bothering her. So the cubs know, stop whatever you're doing. told us he got scratched up by one of these older tigers just the day before. Now, how, how old is this one? He's about 15 weeks. 15? The other two are over there under the porch. One of them is a week older than him, uh -huh. and the other one is a month older than him. Fighting is all about TV. This is just milk. This uh, guy is about 13 weeks old. Uh, this is one of our uh, now famous swimming tigers. Tigers do love the water. They exhale right. their webbing in their paws. Right. Little later on, I will be swimming with tigers. This, yep. As if this weren't dangerous enough, I'll be swimming with tigers, which yep. is a feature that you have for people, right? Right. Yep. Uh, you'll uh, be jumping in the water with this guy. Television variety and talk shows. Six is about five months old. That's Grace. Grace there is about six or seven months old. No, she got bit by one of them a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got we got some new videos in the house. They're extremely limited on coming on who gets to go see them. Yeah. Uh, because their immune system hasn't kicked in yet. Yeah. <coughs> so we don't uh she got bit. That's the only big issues. How old are these guys? This video was put together to show the USDA what was happening. The eight-week-old cub I got sorry. to pet was obviously sick and barely moved during our visit. I don't know how to go to the next one. <laughs> okay. Um, it was a video that we put together to show USDA that by allowing this eight to 12 week old window, what they were doing was enabling all of this bad behavior because as Tracy said, there's just not nearly enough people that can go out and investigate these things. And most of these things happen on the weekends when they're not open. Um, they don't do undercover investigations. So all of the stuff that they ever see about undercover work comes from individuals. I started keeping this chart back in 1999 and it um, shows the number of unwanted big cats. These are calls where people have called me and said, hey, I got this cat I want to get rid of, and how many of them we were able to take. Then you'll see in the far columns where it says found homes for these the first two years. I wasn't tracking that, so that's why I don't have the information. 
And then the other, the fourth column down where it says we offered to take, what that means is in those first years with the asterisk, I wasn't keeping track, but what we do when we offer to take an exotic animal or a big cat, because we only take cats, is that the person surrendering the animal has to contract with us to never own another animal, another exotic animal again. And the reason we do that is because everybody wants to use cubs when they're cute or own cubs when they're cute and play with them and then unload them and then get a new cub. And so if we enable that kind of bad behavior, we're just adding to the problem. So as you can see, in 1999 through 2003, the number of unwanted big cats was really on the rise. And the Captive Wildlife Safety Act passed in December of 2003. What that law did was it made it illegal to sell a big cat across state lines as a pet. So there were a lot of parameters there. But what happened was that the number we were having to turn away each year was doubling every other year. As soon as that one federal bill passed, the very next year that number dropped for the first time ever and it dropped a lot. It dropped to 110 and that was the wake up call for me. That was the moment I realized I can't rescue our way out of this problem. We can only rescue, as you can see over there, the numbers of cats that we take each year. We can only take cats as our older cats die of old age. And so we can't fix the problem by being a sanctuary. And that's why Tracy says sanctuaries are not the answer. The answer is legislation. The numbers, there were nine more states that have passed bans or partial bans just since 2003. And as a result, you see that number continuing to drop. Now there's uh, three variations there. One, 2008, I don't have the little asterisk, but it was true then too where the reason the numbers went back up is because big sanctuaries failed. And the reason big sanctuaries fail is because somebody calls and says, hey, I got 23 tigers, can you take them? And they're like, well, I really can't afford it, but I hate to see them in this bad place, so yeah, go ahead and send them. And then a couple years later, they're in bankruptcy and trying to find places for the animals again. Tracy alluded to this a little bit. Back in 2004, USDA did their first census ever where they went out to all of the USDA facilities. There were 666 of them, which I think is interesting, um, <laughs> that had big cats <laughs> or that had tigers. And they said, how many tigers do you have? Now they just asked for people to be honest. And people said, we have 4,845 tigers in the United States in USDA facilities. USDA does not regulate people who have tigers in their backyards. USDA does not regulate places that are sanctuaries if they're not breeding and they're not open to the public. And so a lot of, like there's one place that I know of that has 300 tigers in uh, Tennessee, but they're not licensed by USDA, so their numbers aren't going to appear in here. What we did in 2012 as part of the coalition was to try and figure out where are the tigers now. And we only found 348 facilities that have tigers and 2,121 tigers in those facilities. But another thing the coalition did was said, okay, for all these people that are showing up at malls and flea markets every year that have to have cubs, we're figuring a very conservative estimate is that they have to be breeding 200 cubs per year just for that petting market. And so if we're adding 200 cubs a year since 2004, and we've dropped down to this number, where are all those tigers going? It costs us $10,000 per big cat per year. And so that tiger right there is the oldest tiger in the world. He was actually in the newspaper for that recently. He's 24 years old. When we take in a cat like him at, I think he was 10 when he came to us, We've made a commitment to that cat for the rest of his life, and that was just the direct cost, as I mentioned before. So we can't rescue our way out of it. When that facility, um, the list that I showed you, there was a facility that failed in 2011. When they went under, they had 56 big cats, mostly tigers, because that's what people will pay to pet. And a couple came to me and said, back in 1996, they had petted cubs at one of these facilities and they knew that the cubs ended up at the sanctuary in Texas and that the sanctuary had gone under and they said they wanted to rescue the remaining tigers there and so they rescued um, seven tigers even though six, only six of them were cats that they had known from back in 1996 and they're paying for the cost of those cats for the rest of their lives. What is so unique about him and the reason I bring him up here is because he's doing something that you guys could do. Once he saw the problem and he saw, hey, I was part of that problem because I was petting cubs and he really wanted to do something about it, he started showing up at these congressional hearings and at state senate hearings and 
uh, testifying as to why we need bans on the private possession of these animals. And he hired a uh, production company to make this video that I think is very good and we often use it when we're dealing with lawmakers. The tiger, the biggest and most majestic cat in the world. It took two million years for the tiger to evolve into what it is today. In 1900, there were 100,000 tigers in the wild. Today, only 3,000 remain. A tragic loss by any measure, but one that many people are already aware of. What people are not aware of is how many tigers exist in this country today. In 1900, the United States had around 50 tigers held by exhibitors. With the advent of zoos and circuses in the 1950s, their population increased to a few hundred. It stabilized in the 1960s when TV and movies lured audiences away from zoos and circuses. But in the 1970s, tigers became popular again, appearing in Las Vegas spectacles and on television variety and talk shows. Animal training became a profession. Tigers were used in advertising and as celebrity ornaments. The idea of exotic pet ownership took hold of the public imagination, with people actually believing they could buy and care for these cats. The tiger population grew from a few hundred to 5,000 today. There are more tigers in captivity in America than tigers that exist in the wild around the world. Zoos, circuses, and sanctuaries account for about 500. The remaining 4,500 tigers are owned by private breeders who breed and sell the cubs, private individuals who keep them as pets, exhibitors who show them, and dealers who collect the old cats and sell them for parts. The tigers in America were not captured in the wild and imported. They were bred here and will remain here for the rest of their lives. They are mixed breeds derived mainly from Bengal and Siberian ancestors and referred to as generic tigers. They have no conservation value and are not regulated by the customary government agencies. This loophole in the law allows these tigers to be bred, bought, sold, and destroyed without being recorded and without consequence. The generic tiger classification, along with commercial popularity, is driving this irrational tiger breeding and has led to their tragic overpopulation. There is no wildlife habitat in the United States for them and no possibility of introducing them back into the wild. They've been raised by humans and are not able to hunt for food. Zoos will not take them because they are generic and not purebred. No one wants them and no one can afford to feed them. They have no place to go. Most of the captive tigers spend their lives in small concrete and chain link prison cells in conditions that most people would readily perceive as deplorable. These old, toothless, starving and abused tigers are found trapped in cages, sometimes piled high with their own waste. Many die prematurely of disease, neglect and starvation, being killed when no longer wanted or dismembered for their parts. This is not a wildlife conservation problem. This is a problem of animal abuse. This is an American tragedy. Together we can change this. Help him get to a good home. Tigersinamerica.org is the site that he set up with all of the video clips. So again, this is why I'm so excited about what you guys are doing, because what if everybody who was a student at a uh, school that used a tiger as a mascot got together and put their voices together for these animals. If you scan this QR code with your smartphone, it'll take
about it? <laughs> That's not what happens when you scan the QR code. <laughs> It'll take you to resources where you can help others learn ways that they can save tigers. You can also find this image as a download on that page that you can print out into a poster to put on bulletin boards. It links to the information about the cub petting because that is the main reason that there are so many tigers being bred and discarded in this country each year. There's so many ways that you can get involved. You can stand outside with a sign. Um, I've done effective to get people together to write letters, to go in and meet with your Congress, your uh, state representatives. The successes that uh, Tracy mentioned, the Detroit Tigers had posed with cubs. They didn't know what a bad thing that was to do. And so what we did was we put it out to our Facebook page and said, hey, what do you think of this? And they put over 1,000 comments on the Detroit, page, Detroit Tigers page saying, this is cruelty, this is abuse. Within two days, they took down those pictures. These places that uh, take cubs out to malls. Is that something with my computer that's causing that? Um, what we did was we had one person who set up a Google alert that let her know every time there were going to be cubs at the mall. I apologize. I just, it's getting Every time there was going to be a cub at the mall, oh, that's much better, uh, <laughs> she would write them all and give them the little fact sheets and say, this is why this is abusive and why it's bad business. You might see some people coming in to pet these cubs, but what you don't see are all the people who go, oh, that's horrible. I would never shop there after they see that. And so 60 malls agreed just in that one year period that we were doing that to never allow exotic cats at their malls again. Uh, showing you what one person can do. PetSmart was letting people come up there with their cubs and you know what they're doing is trying to drive business back to their cub petting displays. And so I wrote PetSmart and I explained to them why this was so wrong. And just that one letter, they wrote me back and said, we had no idea and we're never going to allow people to bring exotic cats into our, our stores in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. You could have been that person that wrote that one letter to one place that could, in fact, with these 60 malls, there's actually 200 malls that are owned in those conglomerates together. So even though only, only 60 of them responded to us, we're pretty sure that if you own one mall and don't allow it here, you're probably not gonna allow it over there. So probably 200 malls or more have agreed not to have these abusive displays. If I knew 20 years ago what I know now, I never would have saved the first cat. I would have gone directly to the stuff that's available to you right this minute, and that is to get involved in changing the laws. We make it easy for you. Uh, we fill out sample letters. All you have to put in is your name and address. It's a lot more effective if you actually write something, but if you don't know what to say, we do it for you there. And you can do that by going to catlaws.com and send a letter. There's a little box you can mark that says, let me know when there's other ways that big cats can use my voice. And if you do that, then you'll get an alert from us once a month on everything that's going on with exotic cats that you can help with. If you do want to get involved in sanctuary work, be sure it's an accredited sanctuary. And the reason I say this is because it's not that hard to be accredited. Accreditation means you don't breed, you don't buy, you don't sell, you don't drag these animals off to schools and flea markets and parking lots. And there's no cost to being accredited. They'll actually loan the, the sanctuaries money to, or give them money, give them grants to bring their standards up. So if they're not complying with that little bit of oversight, there's something wrong with what's going on there. So go to sanctuaryfederation.org. That's the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. They accredit sanctuaries all around the country for all different kinds of animals. And that way you know you're helping a good place. The tigers don't have much time. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that from people that know about what's going on in the wild. So they are really counting on you. Thank you. Unfortunately, a lot of what they say is that if they didn't take the video themselves, they don't know that it hasn't been faked, and so they can't um, consider it to be evidence, which is 
so frustrating to us because we know they don't do undercover, so they're never going to see those things. We have been staying on them as the coalition, um, follow-up calls and saying, look, you know, we came to you guys with this a year ago, what are you guys going to do about it? And there's a whole process of things that could be a whole other talk about what we're doing there. But it is moving, and what you will find is if you sign up with IFA or sign up with us, you'll find out as those things are progressing how that's, how that's moving. Anybody else? Yes. Is there any legal procedure which you feel that the animals are being abused? Is there any process which is available to a citizen if you find there's a tiger in the backyard of a neighbor? He's traveling and he feels towards this cause. Is there any legal option available to a person, a citizen of US? <coughs> what we ask people to do is to contact us and send us photographs, video, anything that they can gather, and then what we try to do for them is to try and figure out what their state laws are on that and see if we can get them some help. But in more of a general term to answer your question, the animal abuse laws in this country typically only cover like pet animals. Even though they say you can have a tiger as a pet, they don't consider tigers as pet animals. So like you, if you were to shoot a cat in your yard, that would be something that you could be fined for or sent to jail for maybe in some states. If you were to shoot a tiger in your backyard, there's not anything that protects that tiger. And is there any prohibition of hunting in this country? Uh, any prohibition prohibition on, hunting? on hunting? Any no. Kind of, any scheduled animal, any endangered species, nothing? Well, there, <laughs> that's interesting. There are canned hunts in a lot of states, including Florida, where I'm from, and Texas where they shoot animals in cages. And they say, well, you can only shoot hoof stock, so like fancy hoof stock. But you go to any of those places, they have cats with tags in their ears. If you ask them, why are there cats here with tags in their ears? They'll say, oh, those are my pet cats. Because they can get away with having it as a pet cat. And of course, the people who pay the dollar, you know, the big money, can then shoot those animals. But you're not going to have anybody from our organizations go in there that they're gonna trust to expose that. So I believe it happens all the time, even though that's illegal. For the endangered species. Um, and a point of clarification, you cannot kill a tiger. It's endangered species. It's covered under the Endangered Species Act, and you will go to federal court if you kill them. And it doesn't matter whether they're captive born, generic tigers, whatever, because U.S. Fish and Wildlife does not actually recognize the various subspecies. They only recognize Panther and Tigris, which is the overall species name. And I know that because in Operation Snowflake, uh, when they caught all of these uh, traffickers of bringing tigers from Missouri up to Chicago, and then they were killing them in the vans, selling the meat to put out on the market as lion meat, because that's illegal, because lions are currently not covered under the Endangered Species Act. And then they were using the hides and other pieces for taxidermy mounts and whatever. This whole outfit was run by by prison guards, federal prison guards, and they all got somewhere between 12 and 14 years each. Uh, the second part, and it has to come down to, everyone likes to come back to the uh, uh, USDA, the Department of Agriculture. These are the same people that go out and inspect meat at, at, the, at the pork processing places and the beef processing places. And initially, I was really, really um, uh, annoyed with, with how what I perceived as just being lazy, didn't give a damn, didn't show up, uh, capricious, uh, uh, ignorant. The point of it is, is that there are so few of them. They're overwhelmed. And these places are all over in the United States. And if they go and make a report, or if they come to a place where somebody says, this is going on with tigers are abusing them and look how bad it is. If they make that report, then they have to go back to their office, then they have to go through all sorts of judicial uh, business, and they're overwhelmed, and so they don't. They don't report it. it and, and I've come around to not blaming USDA, so what you have to think about you guys, and this is the last point I want to make, is that the laws have to be changed if any of this is ever, ever, ever going to stop. And I, I don't know, I think maybe it was your husband, maybe not, um, but somebody once, uh, just very recently, I was asking, um, when you have a, uh, a Senate or Congress uh, bill uh, being looked at uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, and you have uh, a state legislature or senator, how many, how many letters do they get <coughs> on average 
from their constituents. And they say they average nine. Nine. Yeah, where, where does that number come from? That, I don't know who told me that. You didn't tell me that, I don't think. No, the, the average is nine, and that's just uh, the House and Senate keep a record of their constituents. Good. And your average issue, you get nine letters. So if you write 15, you will get paid attention to. If you write 150, you're going to win. And if you call, because nobody calls. When you call there, you're going to be talking to people that sound like they're 12 on the phone. They're not scary. <laughs> call up. Tell them, hey, I want my senator to protect these tigers. I'm going to leave uh, brochures up here. You guys are welcome to get it. It has the cat laws URL on there in case you can't remember catlaws.com. And I have a 